If you're old enough to recall, can you share what it was like growing up in your hometown during the late 1950s and early 1960s? Life seemed simpler back then, right? Many fondly recall their childhood, often describing it with humor and nostalgia. Even though they may joke about it, their words have a genuine warmth. One such memory is the quirky fashion trends, like bell-bottom pants, that our parents thought were the symbol of coolness. Join us as we delve into 20 funny and nostalgic things. You might be old if you remember these things. Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. Have you ever wondered about the origins of the classic drive-in movie experience? Before the era of multiplex theaters, drive-ins were a popular choice for families and couples alike. The first patented drive-in, opened in 1933 by Richard Hollingshead in New Jersey, aimed to provide a comfortable movie-watching experience for those who struggled with cramped theater seats. Over the following decades, drive-ins gained immense popularity, especially during the 1950s and 60s, offering families a space to bond and couples an affordable date-night option. However, drive-ins began to lose their charm with the challenges of seasonal movie screenings, dependence on weather, and economic shifts like the 70s oil crisis. Exploitation films and the rise of home entertainment further contributed to their decline. While many drive-ins closed, some persevered and adapted to the changing times, continuing to offer a unique cinematic experience. Despite the challenges, a few drive-ins still thrive today, showcasing a mix of current and classic films and even offering double feature nights. But did you know that people once had to use sharing tubes to listen to jukebox music? These are just a few interesting facts about jukebox history we are going to explore next. Jukeboxes have a fascinating history that can be traced back to Thomas Edison, the inventor of cameras and light bulbs. A jukebox is a machine that plays music, often found in pubs and bars. You can choose a song by pressing buttons with letters and numbers on them. Some jukeboxes use CDs instead of records. In 1940, the term jukebox became popular in the U.S. During the 1940s and 1950s, jukeboxes were incredibly popular, with three-quarters of all records in America being played on them. During World War II, jukebox production stopped to support the war effort, but it resumed afterward. Jukeboxes were the heart of pubs and bars, providing people with a variety of music. Before jukeboxes, live bands were the only way to hear your favorite tunes. Jukeboxes revolutionized music, giving artists a new way to sell their music. Get in on the fun with the Shoop Shoop Hula Hoop, the hoop with the sound. For more tricks, more fun, get the Hoop of Champions. A hula hoop is a toy hoop that you spin around your waist, arms, or neck. You can also roll it on the ground like a wheel if you're careful. People, both kids and adults, have been playing with hula hoops since at least 500 BC. The idea for the modern hula hoop came from bamboo hoops in Australia. Some say the creators of the plastic hoop we know today saw Australian kids playing with bamboo hoops while driving by in a car. The plastic hula hoop became a big trend in 1958 thanks to the Wham-O Toy Company. Kids' hula hoops are about 70 centimeters wide, while adult ones are around 100 centimeters. People used to make hoops from materials like willow, rattan, grapevines, and stiff grass. But now most are made from plastic. In 1957, the founders of Whammo learned that kids in Australia were using bamboo hoops in gym class. In just a year, they made a plastic hoop called the hula hoop. It became super popular with 25 million sold in two months and $45 million in sales in the first year. Adults bought them for kids but often tried them out themselves. Hula hoops are easy to use but work better for people with thin waists, especially women. The fun trend of hula hoops started in the 1950s with lively marketing in parks, playgrounds, and college campuses. You might know about sock hop, but if you want to go to one or throw your sock hop party, there are a few things you should know. A sock hop, also known as a record hop or just a hop, was a casual dance event for teenagers in North America in the mid-20th century. These events featured popular music and were often sponsored. They started in 1944 during World War II as a way for the American Junior Red Cross to raise funds. 
By 1948, they became a trend among American teenagers and were commonly held at high schools in places like gymnasiums or cafeterias. The name sock hop originated because participants had to take off their hard-soled shoes to protect the gymnasium floor. Music at these events was typically played from vinyl records, sometimes by a disc jockey or live bands. In later years, sock hop became closely associated with the 1950s and early rock and roll, with the term eventually being used more broadly for any informal dance for teenagers. The tradition of removing shoes faded as sneakers and indoor-only footwear gained popularity. A poodle skirt is a wide, swingy skirt made of felt in a single color with a design attached to it, often featuring a styled poodle. Other designs like flamingos, flowers, or hot rod cars were later used instead of poodles. These skirts, typically knee-length, became a hit among teenage girls for school dances and everyday wear. In 1947, Julie Lynn Charlotte designed the first poodle skirt in the United States when she needed a quick Christmas skirt. Struggling with little money and sewing skills, she crafted a seamless felt skirt. The popularity grew, leading to Charlotte creating a dog-themed version. The homemade version involved cutting a felt circle for the waist and adding appliques reflecting personal interests. Poodle skirts gained fame with movie stars and in magazines, becoming the first teenage fashion trend. Charlotte sold the design within a week, eventually opening her factory. Today, poodle skirts are nostalgic symbols of the 1950s, often worn as retro items, with modern reproductions made from contemporary felt. She just takes Swanson TV turkey dinners from the freezing compartment of our refrigerator when I'm a little off schedule. Oh. If we peeked into your fridge, what would we find? Maybe condiments, takeout containers, or something fuzzy and unrecognizable. Don't worry, many of us have fridges like that. Whether due to a busy life or not being great at cooking, sometimes making a homemade meal is tough. That's where frozen entrees come in handy. Frozen convenience foods aren't a new thing, and the credit for their invention is a bit debated. Swanson Brothers are often credited, thanks to a mix-up with Thanksgiving leftovers and a clever idea by salesman Jerry Thomas. Clarence Birdseye is another contender, having developed a system for freezing fresh food in 1923. Swanson's big 1954 advertising campaign made TV dinners a hit, selling over 25 million that year. Over time, frozen meals have evolved, offering diverse options like gourmet dishes, organic choices, and meals for specific dietary needs. Today, the freezer aisle is a far cry from the TV dinners of the 1950s, with a variety of delicious and specialized options for all tastes and preferences. Moving forward, there was also the evolution of convenience in our kitchens. It's fascinating to trace back to a time when doorstep deliveries were the norm. The iconic milkman with his daily rounds delivering fresh milk was once a common sight in neighborhoods across the country. However, as times changed, so did our habits and lifestyles. Now, if you ever wondered who a milkman was and why milk delivery stopped, we'll provide answers in our upcoming exploration. Home milk delivery is making a comeback in the United States, bringing back nostalgic memories for many. The tradition of milk delivery dates back to the late 1700s when families had their cows. As urbanization increased, people turned to local dairy farmers for milk. The first home milk deliveries occurred in Vermont in 1785, with milkmen bringing metal barrels door to door. Customers would order and the milkman would deliver the next day. Milk was placed in insulated boxes or milk boxes built into homes. However, the decline began in the 1930s and 1940s with widespread refrigeration and the rise of grocery stores. Refrigerators reduced the need for frequent milk deliveries, and grocery stores offered a one-stop shop. After World War II, suburbanization increased, making milk delivery more costly. Cars made it easier to access grocery stores independently. By the 1950s, plastic containers replaced glass bottles. Today, the resurgence of home milk delivery taps into a bygone era of friendly milkmen and clinking glass bottles, rekindling memories of a simpler time. Have you ever wondered about the simple circle with three lines inside that has become a global symbol of peace? In 1958, British graphic designer Gerald Holtham created what we now know as the peace sign. 
Initially designed for anti-nuclear activists, it evolved into a representation of world peace and transcended its origins. Holtam drew inspiration from naval semaphore flags combining codes for N and D to signify nuclear disarmament. Yet the design also held a personal, darker meaning for him, a symbol of deep despair. Adopted by the British campaign for nuclear disarmament, it quickly spread to the United States and beyond. From its debut on banners in London to its appearance on Vietnam protest posters and t-shirts in the 1960s, the peace sign has left an indelible mark on popular culture. Have you ever been intrigued by those captivating and unconventional lamps that appear to challenge the laws of gravity? This accent light stands out as the most striking one in America. It brings glamour, interest, and excitement to any place. It keeps changing, pleasing your eyes, and it's like a hypnotic and fascinating show. In 1963, British entrepreneur Edward Craven Walker birthed the iconic lava lamp, a groovy creation with a captivating flow of colored wax in a liquid-filled glass vessel. As the lamp's bulb heats the wax mixture, it rises, cools, and gracefully descends in a hypnotic dance reminiscent of lava flows, hence the name. Initially associated with hippie and cannabis cultures, these lamps have evolved over the years. The magic lies in a unique formula involving mineral oil, paraffin wax, and carbon tetrachloride, now replaced due to toxicity concerns. This concoction's density dance, driven by heat, creates the mesmerizing lava lamp effect. Do you ever notice how history has a way of repeating itself, even in the world of fashion? It's like a deja vu of styles from our parents' golden years, and one trend making a strong comeback is flare pants. These pants, also known as bell-bottoms, have a fascinating origin story. In the early 19th century, sailors in the U.S. Navy sported flared pants because they lacked a set uniform. The British Royal Navy later adopted this style due to its practicality for sailors working on boats. Fast forward to the 60s and 70s when the hippie movement embraced bell-bottoms, often found as surplus Navy gear in thrift stores. The disco era brought its own twists with variations like loon pants and elephant bells. Nowadays, flare pants have taken on various forms, from leggings to trousers. They effortlessly pair with platform sneakers, making a stylish comeback. Screaming Will's Roller Rink, All Night Ramble 375. Here's a reminder about Wednesday from 9 until 3 a.m. Ladies free the first hour. Are you curious about how roller skating, initially a basic wooden contraption in the 18th century, has evolved into a widespread global phenomenon? Join us on a historical journey through the evolution of roller skating, from its humble beginnings to the modern trends that have made it a beloved pastime at Skate World Center. In the 18th century, roller skates began as a basic means of transportation with wooden wheels, which were challenging to maneuver compared to today's advanced designs. The 20th century saw roller skating gain popularity as a recreational activity, with the introduction of ball-bearing wheels revolutionizing the experience. The 1970s and 1980s brought roller disco and roller derby, each with unique charm. In recent years, roller skating has experienced a resurgence with innovative designs, diverse skate options, and a growing community. As we enter the 21st century, roller skating has become a thriving culture, connecting enthusiasts worldwide through social media. Pet rock became a huge trend in the United States in 1975. Gary Dahl, an advertising man from California, came up with the idea during a dinner with friends. His concept was to have a pet that needed no care or feeding. Dahl wrote a pet rock training manual and decided to sell actual pet rocks. He bought inexpensive stones, packaged them in gift boxes with the manual, and sold them for $2 each. The rocks were a hit, and Dahl received numerous orders. By Christmas, he had sold over a million rocks, making him a millionaire. However, the craze quickly faded, and imitators flooded the market. Dahl, having made enough money, gave away unsold rocks to charity. He later focused on a new career, giving motivational speeches and writing books on making money quickly. Pet Rock returned in 2012, but hasn't sold as much as it did in the 70s. Back then, a basic rock became one of the best-selling funny gifts ever. The 70s were pretty cool. Ever thought about how those cumbersome 8-track tapes became a sensation in the 1960s? William Powell Lear, during the early 1960s, 
brought about a music revolution with the creation of the Learjet cartridge, leading to the widespread adoption of 8-track tapes. Originally, they were created for cars as an alternative to AM and later FM radio. The 1970s saw the peak of 8-track tape popularity displayed prominently in record stores alongside vinyl records. However, smaller cassette tapes gained momentum for their compact size in cars and homes. By 1982, major labels stopped selling 8-track tapes to stores, but they continued through record clubs until 1988, making 1980s tapes valuable to collectors. Fleetwood Mac's 1988 release was the last from a major label. Despite major labels abandoning them, smaller companies still produce 8-track tapes today. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton unraveled the mysteries of gravity, but could he have unraveled the mysteries of Rubik's Cube? This Rubik's Cube is a small square, measuring two and one quarter inches on each side. It has rows of squares that can be moved and come in different colors, red, white, yellow, green, blue, or orange. Each side of the cube has nine squares, and the goal is to make all the squares on each side the same color. As for its history, this particular Rubik's Cube belonged to Harry S. Warren, who lived in Wilmington and worked at the Cape Fear Museum for many years. The Rubik's Cube became very popular. It was invented by a person named Rubik in Hungary in 1974 and has been puzzling people for over 35 years. It hit the Western market in 1980 and quickly became a sensation, with over 350 million cubes sold worldwide. Cabbage Patch Kids were super popular dolls in the 1980s. They are cloth dolls with plastic heads made by Coleco Industries in 1982. Inspired by Xavier Roberts' Little People dolls, Roger L. Schlafer renamed them Cabbage Patch Kids when he got the rights in 1982. These dolls broke sales records for three years, becoming a top choice for kids in the 1980s and one of the longest-lasting doll brands in the U.S. Besides dolls, they sold kids' clothes, bedding, babywear, music albums, and board games. In the 80s, Cabbage Patch Kids made about $2 billion in sales. They started with artist Martha Nelson Thomas in the early 70s, but then a guy named Xavier Roberts took her idea and put his name on the dolls, and they became a huge hit. In 1983, the dolls were so popular that there were shortages causing chaos in toy stores. But have you ever come across the golden age of arcade video games? Stick around as we are going to explore. It was a cool time in the late 1970s to early 1980s when arcade games were booming. Space Invaders in 1978 kicked off a frenzy of shoot 'em up games like Galaxian and the space-themed Asteroids in 1979. Thanks to new tech, arcade games went from black and white to colorful adventures like Frogger and Centipede. Arcades became a big deal in pop culture, offering new and exciting games. Have you ever played Defender or Galaga? Or how about chasing mazes in Pac-Man? Driving and racing got a 3D twist with games like Turbo and Pole Position. And who could forget the start of platform games with Donkey Kong? Characters like Pac-Man and Mario became stars, even appearing in songs, cartoons, and movies like Tron in 1982. But in 1983, things took a nosedive. Too many copies of popular games, home video consoles, and worries about kids' influences led to a decline. The 1990s saw a comeback, though. Did you know that breakdancing, also called breaking, started in the South Bronx of New York City in the 1970s? Back then, people in this neighborhood were inspired by the music and dances of the time, like funk, soul, and disco. Breakdancing is closely linked to hip-hop culture and is one of the original four elements of hip-hop, alongside rapping, DJing, and graffiti art. It involves fancy footwork, acrobatic moves, and a lot of creativity. Quickly, it became famous in the United States and around the world. Over the years, breakdancing has changed and adapted, with different styles from various places making it diverse and interesting. The big news is that in 2024, it was declared that breakdancing would be part of the Olympic Games in Paris. Now, can you believe those cozy coverings for legs that look like long, thick socks without the feet? Well, let's dive into the next nostalgic memory. They're not just a fashion statement. They serve the practical purpose of keeping your lower legs toasty in chilly weather. Whether you're cycling, playing soccer, hiking, ice skating, or dancing, leg warmers are your go-to companions. 
Originally made from sheep wool, modern ones can be cotton, synthetic fibers, or even chenille. Ballet dancers use them to keep their leg muscles warm and prevent cramps, but there's no solid proof yet if they really prevent injuries. Back in the 1980s, leg warmers became a trendy fashion, especially for teenagers influenced by movies like Fame and Flashdance. Nowadays, they've made a comeback, not just for fashionistas, but also for practical parents keeping their little ones warm and making diaper changes a breeze. Are mullets cool again? They just might be. Even though mullets might not be the first thing you think of when it comes to stylish hair, they have a surprisingly ancient history. Mullets were a popular choice for warriors in ancient times, like Native Americans, Romans, Vikings, and ancient Celts. It wasn't a fashion statement back then, it was a practical choice for war. Long hair at the back kept soldiers warm, while a short front prevented hair from getting in their faces during battles. In the 19th and 20th centuries, mullets got a bad reputation and were seen as a sign of low social class. But the rebellious spirit associated with mullets has endured. In the early 60s and 70s, they became a symbol of defiance. So, are mullets making a comeback? History says they've always had a knack for being unexpectedly cool. Mixtapes, those nostalgic compilations of music on cassette tapes, hold a special place in the hearts of those who remember the era of cassettes. In the 1980s, people exchanged mixtapes to convey messages or set a mood. These tapes, made by compiling songs from various sources, were a blend of creativity and personal expression. Initially a popular trend among DJs, mixtapes became a way for artists to showcase their skills and for DJs to create demos for potential clients. They were also a backup plan for parties in case of equipment failure. However, the practice of creating mixtapes led to piracy issues in the 70s and 80s, prompting changes in the music industry.